தமிழகம் தமிழகம் திம்பம் உங்கள் டிவி Welcome to Crossroads on TVI. I'm your host, Manjula Salvaraja. Last year, we started a conversation on asylum seekers across the globe. We spoke to author Benjamin Dixie about a Tamil asylum seeker he interviewed in the UK. It was quite compelling. We thought that we'd show a segment of that before we get on to the show. Here is that interview. So this one guy, he was 29 years old, and I met him in London, and I, and I interviewed him about his experience being tortured. And he sat there and he looked me in the eye and told me for about two hours this extreme story of being tortured for six weeks, locked in a dark room and being tortured and, you know, manner of violence that is hard to talk about. But he spoke to me in a real matter of fact. He didn't cry. He didn't even shake. He just told me the story. Then he got onto the story about what it's like to be here in England as an asylum seeker. And every week he has to go to an office to sign on as the asylum seeker to re uh, also receive his weekly allowance to live. But one week he went to sign on and his asylum had been refused. So the UK border agency grab him there and take him to Heathrow Airport to detain him and send him back to Sri Lanka. He understands if he goes back to Sri Lanka, he'll be tortured and killed. So he went to hang himself at the detention centre because that's the easier way is to die here in Heathrow than face torture again back in Sri Lanka. So he hung himself, but he didn't kill himself. He just twisted his spine. So he goes to hospital for two weeks. He's now back in the, uh, in the process of asylum uh, through appeal. Every week he has to go and sign on thinking today I might be grabbed again is, and yeah. tonight I might have to commit suicide again. He's been going through that period for two years. So for those, and that's when he started to cry when he was telling me this story, not the torture story, because this was the mental torture. Today we speak to two guests on the state of affairs with regards to asylum seekers to Canada. Are attitudes hardening or softening? Borders closing or opening? Let's meet our guests. Jennifer Heinemann is a professor in social science and geography at York University and associate director of research at their Center for Refugee Studies. She is the author of the books Dual Disasters, Humanitarian Aid After the 2004 Tsunami and Managing Displacement. Let me read that right. Refugees and the Politics of Humanitarianism and co-editor of Sites of Violence, Gender and Conflict Zones among other publications. Wow, you've got quite a lot on their CV there. So glad to have you here, Jennifer. Thank you. Petra molnar Diop is a researcher and refugee advocate. She has worked with the Roma community and has researched how they have been affected by recent changes in Canadian refugee legislation. She has been affiliated with a number of settlement organizations in Toronto, the Canadian Council for Refugees, and is a researcher for the Singa Project. She's currently completing her law degree at the University of Toronto. Congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me That's here. changed, I think, since we last spoke. Yes, that's right. Well, it's such a pleasure to have you here for a couple of reasons. Um, I was at a wedding show that our station had, was a media sponsor of last night, and I ran into people that w watch the show. And, uh, and whenever people see us, the, the production team, they always give us ideas, and they really wanted us to explore. This was one of the things that came up. So, and I know that it's been a year now. We wanted to have the show about a year ago, so really glad we could make it happen today. So let me start off with, with you, Jennifer. I mean, we've, we've seen different policies and regulations um, come across not just Canada, but different countries. Do you think borders are opening or closing to asylum seekers? I do think we're in a period uh, where the doors are closing. Uh, I think that a more important point is that people aren't even being allowed to get to the door. In some cases, the doors are open, but if you can't, if you can't see the door or you're too far away from it, you, you'll not know whether it's open. And I think detention on islands, this is a, a very acute policy that Australia has taken. Nauru, Manus Island, and Papua New Guinea, very extreme version, but it's very hard to know 
exactly what's going on in Australia if you're sent to an island to have your asylum claim uh, processed. So that's an extreme example, but unfortunately, Canada, Europe, um, the US and other countries have taken similar, if not the same, drastic measures. Interesting. Petra, do you want to add to that? Sure. I mean, I think some of these attitudes are definitely present within Canada and within the Western world as well. I mean, you have Lampedusa Island in, in Italy, where you have hundreds of migrants coming and they are shipped off to detention centers and warehoused there. And even to people who make it in Canada, I mean, a lot of people don't realize, but we have detention centers here in Ontario, in Toronto as well, where people who are there and who have a right to make a refugee claim don't get access to their legal representatives or, or community workers as they should. Interesting. Now, you said something interesting. It wasn't just a matter of the door closing, but you think the process to get to the door is harder. What do you mean by that? Well, I think we, the, the final numbers for 2013 have yet to be calculated. But in the first three quarters of 2013, we know that uh, the number of asylum seekers making a refugee claim in Canada is lower than ever before and lower even than in 19, you know, since 1989 when the system was established. So if we, if we take those numbers and we extrapolate for the year, 10,000 people will have made a refugee claim. That is usually the numbers are averaging over those since 1989, around 24 to 27,000. So that's half the numbers. Less than half. Okay. So what I'm saying is it's not that the acceptance rate has changed significantly, but the number of people being, who are able to make a claim has changed. Okay. So if you don't allow people to make a claim by, through various measures, then you're going to obviously have lower numbers, but you have the question, it begs the question, you know, who's been, who's been excluded, who's been left out, who's in danger, but has not been allowed to make a claim. So you know what, this is interesting. We're going to dig into this a little bit deeper, but I think it would be interesting for myself and our audience mm -hmm. to understand how actually someone applies as an asylum seeker. Perhaps you can walk us through the process to Canada. Sure, sure. So, I mean, we can look at it in two ways. We can look at the system um, as starting through the U United Nations. Um, and there is a group of uh, refugees which are the government assisted refugees. Those are the refugees that are generally picked by a country and then brought over here and resettled with assistance. Um, my work in particular deals with the second group, which are um, autonomous asylum seekers, which are people who come to the border of Canada and they make a refugee claim. And you can do this in two ways. You can either make the claim right at the border, which is called a port of entry claim, and then you basically funnel yourself through the system that way. Or you can get into Canada through other means, such as on a work or a tourist visa, and then you make an inland claim. And in both of those instances, you submit a number of forms, sometimes you get legal representation if you are lucky enough because there are many, many asylum seekers who do not have representation at all, and then you proceed with your refugee uh, adjudication. Interesting. Now, I know that there's also a process that, that flows through the UN. Perhaps you can shed some light on that. Jennifer. Well, yeah, uh, what's interesting is those numbers have dropped drastically for the asylum seekers that Petra talks about, but they've also gone down. The government-assisted um, UN. Uh, UN referrals has also gone down in Canada. So oh, that's interesting. Okay. So the numbers have generally been around 7,500 for government-assisted refugees over, over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, there was a time in the early 90s when that number was about 14,000. So now it's... For, uh, for 2013, it's going to be around 6,500. So you can see some drastic changes in that period, but I think that uh, those are the refugees who are chosen to come. That's a voluntary program. It's at the discretion of the government. It's a wonderful thing that Canada does, and it's part of the reason that Canada's reputation for so long has been very, you know, very good in terms of its treatment of refugees. Uh, those numbers are, we're seeing those numbers decline now, Hopefully they'll they'll bump back up a little bit. Uh, the government only met seventy five percent of its target. In um, but, but that, that still doesn't take us to forty thousand. The numbers that they used to be. What is a government assisted refugee? Like how how does that work? So so basically you've got um, you've got communities throughout Canada and uh, we have somewhere as I said about seventy five hundred people normally um, have been referred. They are given what's called income assistance support for one year. Um, they don't have to take that if they are able to find a job, but it gives people a chance to hone their English and French skills to, um, to really give them the kind of toolkit they need to succeed in the labor market. 
and to you know be, belong to become part of Canadian society. So they're referred normally, as uh, Petra mentioned, through the UNHCR, the United okay. Nations High Commission for Refugees. So they're often selected from camps, particularly camps in Africa. But um, they, they have also come, we've had lots of people come to Canada from Bosnia, from Kosovo, from uh, oh, so many countries, uh, Burma, uh, uh, Karen refugees, uh, mm. Bhutanese refugees, so many uh, countless countries we could, we could speak of. Of course, Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. uh, for many years. In fact, Sri Lanka was one of the top source countries for refugees throughout the 1990s. Interesting. Now, I also hear that process also a delayed process that I've heard before, right? So that, mm -hmm. that for another show, perhaps, <laughs> we probably should go into that. So, you know, I'm curious to hear your opinion, because both of you work in, in the community as well, is um, about attitudes. I remember when the two boats came here with the Tamil migrants, I mean, I don't even know why I made the mistake of reading comments on articles, which apparently you should not do. Even journalists <laughs> will tell you that, other journalists in the mainstream media. But some of these things were extremely hurtful. So do you think, I mean, is, is this just typical backlash, the typical 10 people that'll complain no matter what? Or do you think attitudes are actually hardening when it comes to the public in Canada? Jennifer? I think attitudes often follow kind of government leadership and uh, follow uh, media reporting. And we have to be very careful. If you repeat the word bogus refugee enough times, people will start to think there's a problem. Mm -hmm. When bogus refugee is uttered before a person has even had a chance to file a claim and have a hearing, that's, that's you know, quite unfair in terms and quite problematic in terms of public opinion. And, and if we look back historically, we've got conservative governments under Joe Clark you know, agreeing to bring in 50,000 Indo-Chinese refugees in the late 1970s. So there's, there's, and public opinion was at a peak in terms of supporting that. People were willing to privately sponsor, pay out of pocket. Groups of five temples, mosques, churches all got together and, you know, public opinion was pro-refugee. I think we have to be very careful not to let um, the uttering of a few um, damaging comments. Even the public safety minister was cited as, as calling people terrorists before they'd ever arrived in their boat. That's so prejudicial that um, in the end, people were given, were given status in Canada because um, there was so much prejudicial, you know, uh, stereotypical, I don't know what you want to call it, but Language absolutely statements, unfair yeah. <laughs> statements made before a person has made a claim. And so public opinion will follow and it's really up to the media our political leaders, our community leaders, to, to change that discourse and, and hey, let's, let's look at the people who are coming here who've come from horrific situations, such as the, the interview at the outset of the show. That the gentleman, yeah. uh, that the gentleman mentioned. Petra, do you want to add to that? Sure, I think it's, it's very interesting when you look at um, these, these two cases of the two boats, because it seems like whenever there's a boat that docks, there's this mass hysteria that surrounds it. But Really, when you when you look at the numbers arriving, it's it's really not that many, and we make it seem like there's this huge flood of bogus refugees who are going to sweep across Canada and take advantage of our hospitality. But that's really not what's going on. And like Jennifer mentioned, I mean, these people when they come here and make a refugee claim, they should have access to due process, and they should not be considered guilty um, until proven innocent. I mean, they they do have a right to make a refugee claim and they should not be considered bogus just because uh, the government seems to be wanting to link these particular communities to, to being bogus. Now, I know that you've advocated in, um, for the Roma community here in Canada. Perhaps actually for our audience, you can tell us a little bit about the Roma community before we talk about them. Sure, I can do that. Um, so not that many people know about the Roma community, but they, they are thought to have originated in India and have spread to Europe around the 11th century with the expansion of the Ghaznavid Empire. And then since then they've been kind of across Europe and they're not nationally bounded. So there are Roma communities in, in Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary and all across even France, Italy. And uh, there has been a history of Roma migration into Canada. So this is nothing new. Um, and there's, there's a sizable population in Canada, especially in the greater Toronto area. And, I mean, in the recent years, there's been an interesting linkage, again, with uh, the government using the term bogus and linking it with Roma refugees in particular. And 
it's it is problematic because I mean a lot of these these groups they do come from countries that are considered to be democratic and safe and part of the European Union so that's often used to explain that they cannot be legitimate refugees but however I think that this kind of analysis is a bit naive because um, based on your and on, on any number of characteristics whether it's your age your sexual orientation your ethnicity your experience in a particular country or setting is not going to be the same as another person's so presupposing that somebody is bogus just because they come from a democratic country I think is a little reductionist well it's interesting because the Roma was cited a lot uh, when it comes to C31 which we're going to talk about next and and that's why it's it's Amazing to have you on here to, to tell us a little bit more about the Roma community. But do you think that those attitudes, like do you, do, does the Roma community feel that the attitudes are hardening themselves? Like, what are you hearing from them? So, I mean, when I've spoken to people, it, it seems like on the initial arrival to Canada, um, people are very, very happy to be here. And they say it's a great change from some of the countries that they've come from. It doesn't seem to be, you know, the kind of overt blatant racism that they experience in, say, the Czech Republic or Slovakia. But that does kind of start to erode as, especially under the old system, claims took, you know, two or three years sometimes. People were stuck in limbo. And now with this kind of really hateful, even vitriolic kind of sentiments coming from the government, um, people are definitely starting to take note. And of course, because the Roma people... Um, it's one of those groups that people just don't really know very much about and there's all this kind of stereotypical language also being used like linking the gypsy kind of swindling gypsy idea into it. It's so you think people are hearing that message because definitely. they actually perhaps even encounter Absolutely. A, a Roma person. That's Absolutely, interesting. Yeah. So we are going to move to talking about C31. I mean that was the original reason that a year ago we discussed um, having uh, getting you together for this show. Um, Tell us a little bit about C31 before we, we talk about it. What, what, what is, why is everyone up in, why was everyone last year in an uproar about it? Well, I think it introduces some, uh, it has some laudable goals, which is to make the system more efficient, but no one ever wants to compromise on fairness and, uh, and kind of due process. So I think uh, one, one concern that people have is that now there's a set of safe countries that Petra referred to. And those um, are called designated countries of origin. And if, you, if you're making a claim from one of those, those countries, they're deemed to be pretty safe. So therefore, your claim is, is deemed to be pretty dubious, which means, A, you don't have a chance for appeal. And B, if you are denied, you, first of all, you have, you have just 30 days to prepare and get your, your case together, a very short timeline um, for anyone doing any type of legal um, representation. Um, but you're really looking at... Uh, a kind of two-tiered system. Um, a discri you're, you're discriminated against uh, on the basis of your country of origin. So the thing, you know, the problem with this situation is Canada finds itself accepting refugees from these safe countries. And almost 500 people in uh, 2013, in the first three quarters, were accepted from Hungary and Mexico alone. Those are both safe countries. But in fact, people got here, made claims, and were accepted. So there are legitimate human rights issues that, that you know, the government accepts as legitimate. People are being granted refugee status if they come here, but there is this two-tiered system, which I think is, is of grave concern to many people. Interesting. I know that, um, were there particular reasons that Hungary and Mexico were put on that list? Was uh, it a volume, perhaps? Uh, well, they're, th yes, they are, they are major source countries of, uh, of, of claimants, but because Hungary is in the EU, because Mexico has a constitution that um, in theory, is is very you know makes a lot of protections for a lot of reasons, including LGBT refugees. In theory, those people are are covered. In practice, we know that many claims are legitimate, mm -hmm. and people have experienced violence from the state or the police, you know, itself. So, people are making legitimate claims, and they're getting into Canada as refugees because they have a they have a good case. So you could be turned down if you if you're an applicant from Hungary under C31 simply because you are from a safe country, is that right? Not quite. It means that you will be given less access to the system. You'll be given ah. a shorter time to prepare, okay. one hearing only by one person only. And no appeal. Mm -hmm. And no appeal. Of course. So oh, that, is, that is quite the, uh, the difference. A truncated well, system. Well, we're going to go to a break and we'll come back. Okay. We're going to speak more about this. You're watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Salvaraja.
Oxford's on TVI. We're discussing the plight of asylum seekers to Canada with Jennifer Heinemann and Petra molnar -Diop. And I should mention that you are now actually the director of research at the Centre for Refugee Studies. Is that right? It is. Okay, good. Congratulations. Thank you. More work, right? Of course. <laughs> okay. Right. So now there was one other point that you wanted. We, we spoke about this in the break. I think we ought to do it on the show as well about C31. Uh, well, it's actually a, a point um, that my colleague at York, uh, Professor Sean Rehag, has made. He's a law professor, and there's a there's a um, what's called Clause 19. It's called cessation, and it's of interest to your viewers, I think, because what it says is that if you have permanent residence status in Canada and you came to Canada as a refugee, it's possible that you could lose your permanent residence status if you, for example, renew your passport in Sri Lanka, or uh, Hungary for that matter, if you um, go back to live in Sri Lanka and appear to be what's, what, availing yourself of the protection of your previous country. That is to say, okay. if you're behaving as though you're a citizen of the country and feel comfortable with that, Canada, as far as I know, has not yet done this, but Canada can now has take right. away okay. your permanent residence status. Now, again, if you're going back to visit a sick parent for a couple of weeks, you're probably okay, but... Um, is that at the discretion of the minister? It is discretionary, yes, and I think discretion is something that has grown with C31. We have irregular arrivals, is at the discretion of public safety minister. Um, there's discretion in, in a number of areas that, that didn't exist before, and I think that we... Um, I, I would like to see the rule of law be our, our, our standard so that we just don't have too much wiggle room and... What does it yeah. mean? I think we should explain to the audience what you mean when you say discretion. I, I think discretion by the minister. You mean that the minister has somewhat of a right to pick and choose? Well, for example, if another boat were to arrive today, the minister could designate that as an irregular set of arrivals. And what that would mean for the people on the boats is that they could make a refugee claim, but even if they were successful, they would have to wait five years for permanent resident status they would not be able to sponsor their relatives until at least five years in. So we're talking eight, ten years families could be separated. And a kind of, again, a kind of two-tier system for refugees. Yes, you're a legitimate refugee, but you came on a boat, so you're going to have to wait five years before you can have the rights, kind of a number of rights, employment rights and so on. And uh, you, you'd be in detention as well, arriving as an irregular. As opposed to a refugee who arrived on a plane or drove a car across... The well, border. the driving the car across is actually an interesting example because we've only had one set of formally designated irregular arrivals, and those were people who drove across the border in Quebec and, and drove in without authorization. Okay. And interestingly, they were designated irregular much, much later, not at the time of their, 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 their yeah. drive-through, <laughs> yeah. but much later. And again, no one knew this was going to happen, but it did. Um, in 2013, as far as I know, there have been no designations of irregular arrivals, nor have there been any boats, as it were. Okay. So now you've been researching how, uh, and just so we get back to, I can't remember what the bill was. What was the, the title of the bill of, uh, before it became, um, before it was passed in the House of Commons, C31? Uh, protecting Canada's immigration system. Protecting mm -hmm. Canada's immigration system. So it was a bill last year. It went through the House and, and is now, went from being Bill C31 to C31. Now you've been researching how that has impacted mm -hmm. uh, the Roma community. Can you speak to that? Sure. So, I mean, like Jennifer mentioned, this is, there's a tension here between wanting to do something or implementing a system that's efficient but also making sure that the system is still just. And unfortunately, I, I mean, I'm all about efficiency. And before, people would wait, you know, five, even ten years before the whole process was finalized, which is a long time. But now we are basically compromising due process and the rule of law for what's called efficiency. I mean, we've seen people scribble these forms down on garbage cans before citizenship and immigration and just handing them in because they're so worried that they will not make it in time, you know, because these people have 15 to 30 days to submit all the documents and then 60 additional days to submit all their evidence. Now, if you think back, I mean, in some countries, it's very difficult to get your evidence. You have to contact police, sometimes hospital records, even getting a, a real passport can be a problem. And if your country of origin is not cooperating with you, 60 days is no time. So clearly, Bill C-31 
um, presents significant challenges to, to communities um, who have to operate on such strict timelines. And because the Roma uh, population fits under the designated safe countries list, they have extremely short time even to just retain legal representation. Um, so the quality of the claims that we've been seeing have gone down because people just don't have time to provide the kind of evidence they need in order to make a refugee claim. That is a, that is a shorter time frame, a significantly shorter time frame. Now, what was interesting ar around the time that these boats were arriving in um, uh, with the Tamil migrants is there was this word that where people they kept it wasn't just the words terrorists or that they're you know taking money out of our system but this idea that they were queue jumpers right and um, so I a question that I'd like to put put to you um, do you think that they are or could you explain if if they are unfairly jumping this queue because the answer I would get from everyone is well there's no real queue I think I'd love to hear a full explanation of that. Sure. Well, you're right. your, your answers have been correct. There is no queue, um, and there is no quota, and there is no limit. Uh, international law, I think, is our best reference point. We, there's, a, there's a convention called the Refugee Convention, 1951, and a subsequent protocol that's not that important. But in it, there, it outlines that a person may make a claim, and, and Petra referred to this as well. You have a right to make a claim. You don't have a right to asylum, but you have a right to make a claim um, and there is no limit on how many of those people or those claims can be made at any given port of entry, at any given, in any given country. So there is no queue. Um, if you're talking about resettled refugees waiting in a camp, maybe there is a queue. Maybe they prioritize and maybe there's a list. I, I'm not sure exactly how it works. I, I, I have actually participated in that pro process in the 90s, but I haven't done so recently. But when it comes to asylum seeking, the convention does not state anything about there being a limit, a queue, a quota, or any limit on basically upholding your human rights. I'm, that would be kind of silly, you know, to say we can only rescue a few people from torture. Yes. Um, ultimately, you can see the logic of why there shouldn't be a queue mm -hmm. if people are truly in, in need of protection. Well, I mean, this is um, the, the other topic that came about, uh, the queue jumping I heard so often. The other one was this idea, I mean, some of the, some of, one of the reasons that the uh, minister, I think it was Kenny at that point, that was guiding this bill along, C31, was um, that there was a lot of fear around human smuggling, right? And um, one of the things that I heard on a news show is a researcher saying that a lot of refugees that come to Canada depend on human smugglers. Is there any insights that you can provide on that? Absolutely. I think this is an area where there's a lot of misunderstanding among the public. I mean, it's, it's very hard to separate activities that can fall under what would be considered human smuggling or illegal activities that a person has to resort to when they're making a, a refugee claim. I mean, if you think that you have to flee your house in the middle of the night and you have to try and make a passage to Canada, chances are at some point you may have to avail yourself of the services of a human smuggler or perhaps a fake passport or something like that. I mean, many, many asylum seekers who do make it to Canada at some point actually engage in some of these activities. But I don't think um, that having done so should preclude them from having the right to make a claim. I'd just like to add to that that the, the harder you make it to get to a Canadian border, the more likely people are going to need a smuggler to get here. And a, 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 um, a recent study mm -hmm. out of Harvard, um, the Immigration and Refugee Clinic there, has shown that um, with the implementation of agreements, for example, there's something called the Safe Third, Agre Safe Third Country Agreement. It means that no asylum seeker can come through the U.S. to Canada to make their claim. If they've, stopped, if they've come from the U.S., they must make it there. So, so that um, makes it difficult for people who, who thought they could seek asylum. Maybe they're Sal El Salvad Salvadorians, for example, who, who can't get asylum easily partly because the U.S. government has had a hand in conflict in that country. So they know their chances are better coming to Canada, but they get to the border and they realize, oh, I don't have any family in Canada. I can't make a claim. I need to get myself smuggled in so that I can do, make an inland claim, that, that is to say, here at the Etobicoke office, mm -hmm. as Petra mentioned earlier. So in fact, if you don't let people get to the door and you make it very hard to do so, you in some ways incentivize illegality in the form of human smuggling, if you like. That's an interesting so, point. So it's, it's, a, it's what I would call a recursive relationship, where it's kind of instigated in part by the regulations that 
the buffer zone that's created around the borders of Canada, and Canada already is protected by geography quite handily. Those Arctic seas and even those, uh, those Atlantic and Pacific oceans are pretty cold most of the time. So these are just extra walls that are going up. So now let's talk about some of the things that they run into once they get here. I mean, there have been recent changes to health benefits for refugees. Um, Petra, I'll start you off on that. I mean, what are your thoughts on these? Perhaps you can tell us what the changes are first. Sure. Well, I mean, there was a recent development, uh, which is a great news for everybody. Um, Ontario decided to step up and basically fill the gap that was mm -hmm. left when the, the refugee health care was cut. Um, basically, when it was cut, um, all basic health services for refugees that were there were done away with. So, for example, we were seeing pregnant women who were unable to access health care while they were making their refugee claim. And they already had gone through what's called the eligibility interview phase which is part of your refugee claim where you go and you meet with an official at the Etobicoke Center and they say that yes you are actually allowed to make a refugee claim and then you have to wait and then you have your determination. So these people were past that point already but they were unable to access health care. We were seeing people who had epilepsy and they were unable to have medication, severe um, trauma from torture and, and rape and these people were basically denied basic, basic health care. Now, um, I think Manitoba was the first province that stepped up and filled the gap left by the, this cut, and then Ontario very recently announced that they would do that as well, which I think is a wonderful development. But still, that doesn't address the, the very problem which is coming from the federal government. Now, that, that also means that in all of the other provinces, people do get stranded then. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Would you like to add to that, Jennifer? Well, I think the provinces are stepping up because it's the right thing to do, and constitutionally, you know, governments have an obligation to protect people on their territory. And I think some refugee lawyers in Canada are actually um, testing whether or not you can take away such basic health provisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that this is being done as a deterrent so that people won't make claims. So things like introducing detention and taking away any health care access unless you're a threat to other Canadians, um, public, public health threat, is is very problematic. Whether or not it works, we know that detention is not an effective deterrent. So introducing these kinds of punitive measures has a takes a toll on not only those people but but all the you know all of the Canadian Canadian society at large, I think. And um, yeah, I do think it's short sighted. The provinces are stepping up, I think, because they have to and they feel it's the right thing to do. I've been seeing, I, I did see a, a few protests from healthcare workers mm -hmm. as well on this issue because I think some of them were giving a bit of their time and seeing, um, seeing refugees regardless. Actually, I'd read an article about that too. So let's, let's talk about the restarting of the sponsorship of uh, parents and grandparents. Petra, you definitely, you mentioned this to me, mm -hmm. so I know this is something that you want to speak about. This is, I mean, when you, when you first read it, you think, well, this is some good news. Right, I mean, it, it, it is good news because I think there's a cap of 5,000 family members that can make um, that they can try and bring their, their parents and grandparents over. But I think this, this, this new development also brings with it some problematic provisions. For example, I believe now you have to basically underwrite you, the, the person that you're bringing in for 20 years, which means you have to basically take care of them financially no matter what happens for 20 years. If you're bringing in an elderly parent, perhaps for, for child care or you just want to be reunited with your family, and something happens, you are the one who's responsible for footing the bill. For 20 years, that's a long time. And of course, not everybody can afford that. So again, yes, it's great that this program is now in place again. And I believe it's only going to be in place for a year until it's capped off again. Um, but really, who can afford to, to, to have this kind of commitment for 20 years? So again, there, there are clear problems in, in the way that the, the government is handling this. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I concur with, uh, with Petra. I think it's a positive move because yeah. families need to be united for people to feel secure and feel settled and to be able to do their jobs in a productive and enthusiastic way. I think that grandparents are often a huge boon to our economy, very invisible. All the childcare, Canada's crying for childcare mm -hmm. of all kinds. Because we don't have it, yeah. And uh, there have been critiques that, oh, but these are elderly people who will need more health care than most. Well, they might need more health care, but they're being supported by their families largely and they are supporting their families in the sense that doing this invisible work, I am, I'd like to have an economist here to corroborate my point of view, but I actually think their contributions 
and allowing people to get into the workforce and help our labor market grow, this Probably is outweigh. by far a greater contribution. And you know who's found this? Uh, Quebec has found this. Yes, mm -hmm. they subsidize childcare to the tune of $7 a day for people, but it pays for itself three times over, mm. given the people who can now go into the workforce, pay taxes, all of the things that help provide public infrastructure and social well-being, schools and all of that. The, so, the barriers are substantial, though. Mm -hmm. The barriers that they've provided mm -hmm. for people to apply to these. It's, it's tough. And family reunification is a huge issue in this country. It takes a very long time to bring a family member over. And only, you know, you're only talking dependents, partners, and parents, for the most part. There are a few exceptions to that, but it's, it's very much so it's already family. Limited. How long is the process for family reunification? Because I know it's limited to certain family members. Well, in, in the experience of refugees who've, who've, uh, that I know who've come and you know, sought their Canadian citizenship and are P, either PR or citizens already, it's taken three to five years on average. And that's, I'm not in, the, in the, the business of doing that on a daily basis, yeah. but it's a long that's time. That's a long time. It's a mm -hmm. long way. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you just think about it from an economics perspective, it makes sense. If, if you can guarantee that you will have, for example, two working parents as opposed to one, it does make sense to reunite a family. But then again, it's these popular kind of ideas that why would you want to bring an elderly person from a third world country to Canada? They're just going to be a drain on the economy. More on that when we come back. We're going to take another break. Um, stay with us. You guys stay with us too. You're watching Crossroads on TBI with Manjula Salvaraja. Welcome back to Crossroads on TVI. We are discussing the plight of asylum seekers to Canada with Jennifer Hindman and Petra Molna Diop. Petra, I have a question for you. Um, I think that we, whenever we bring people on and when I don't ask them about what they're working on, we hear from viewers. So I'd love to know what the Singer Project is. Sure. So I've been involved with the Singer Project for, I think, about seven months now. And they're an, initi an initiative that started in Paris, France. And uh, they've been doing some really great work on trying to improve the integration of refugees who have come to France. Um, and they, they try and empower refugee claimants. Um, and they also try and um, involve the business community and try and look at how integration can be done through kind of a more entrepreneurial perspective. So they link um, refugees with established businesses. They, they give out small loans. They, uh, they also do uh, like targeted um, well, because they're in Paris, they do the French language training. So, for example, if, if you're a person who wants to train as a plumber, they, uh, they, would, they would give you specific training pertaining to that profession. And the way I'm involved with them is they commissioned uh, a worldwide study looking at how information and communication technologies are being used by refugees. Mm -hmm. So, there have been a number of countries that have signed on. Um, I think there is, there's Australia, Kenya, Canada. I'm part of the Canadian uh, research team, so we, we did a small study in the GTA and in the, uh, the Ottawa area, and we hope to get it published and hopefully presented at a few conferences next year. Oh, that's wonderful. Perhaps you can come and tell us about it. Sure, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah, we'd absolutely. love to have you on again. And I know that you've been working on a project, because I've actually heard from multiple people about it. It sounds very interesting. It's um, Migrant Geographies of Politics, Identity and Belonging. What is this? Well, it's a broad, that's a very broad title, which allows us to do a lot of things. It's still early days on our reporting, but I'm working with two very bright and motivated researchers, uh, Dr. Um, Amarnath Amarsingham and Gayatri uh, Naganathan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have done four focus groups and something like 52 interviews, which we're transcribing now. We're trying to look at how events in Sri Lanka affect people who, who live here in the greater Toronto area. Uh, we know that 2009 was a brutal and difficult year for, for everyone who, who follows politics in Sri Lanka. And here in the greater Toronto, well, in Canada at least, we have, we have the single largest Sri Lankan diaspora in the world of any other country. So how are people here affected by events there? I'm a geographer by training, so I'm interested in how uh, people's connection to place 
how, for example, people living here might have been affected by the human rights abuses, by the uh, end of military conflict with a lot of blood and, and terrible violence that most of us witness secondhand, very thankfully, or third. But how those events changed or didn't are notions, feelings, for example, of Tamilness, feelings mm. of wanting to stay in Canada even longer. Um, we talked to people who, who, were, who both left Sri Lanka themselves, some as refugees, some as family members, other groups, immigrants. Um, and we also spoke to their children. So we've got two generations that we're looking at. And of course, connections to um, a place like Sri Lanka are going to vary. If you were mm. born there and you, know, you left there and you have land and an ancestral home, both, both groups are going to have connections there, but how are they different? And how are the events of 2009 shaping um, how people feel? And we're finding in a preliminary way that, the, that those, that younger generation born in Canada, if you like, the second generation as sometimes social scientists call it, mm -hmm. uh, were, were very much eschewing. They were upset with all kinds of groups for not acting when the moment was raw and when the human rights atrocities. And that is the generation that you would say has spent a longer time here or were born here? Is born that what you here, mean? yeah. They might have visited back home, but you know, they were, some were disappointed that the Canadian government didn't take more action. So they said, I used to call myself Canadian, but now I call myself Tamil first, Canadian second. So we heard anecdotes like this, and we, we, have, to, we have a lot more uh, analysis to do, but that's the gist of it. That's interesting. And when is, when is there going to be something substantial that people can read or see? Well, we do have to hope to have something by this fall that okay. at least we can circulate to all the people who participated in the studies. It was open to anyone who was interested in participating, and uh, we wish we had more money to do more. But we might well do a second phase. We'll have to see what comes of it. But by the end of this year, we hope to have some results and some insights that we can more share with show you. ideas this is great <laughs> I've got two already so let's come back to um, something that we talked about on the break again which is this idea of acceptance rates when it comes to asylum seekers and I think we should touch on this thankfully because we have a couple of minutes left so um, so talk to us about acceptance rates uh, well I think acceptance rates have I think they have uh, gone down a little bit in the last decade mm -hmm. and I think we can attribute some of that to a certain harmonization between the US and Canada uh, smart border accord and various efforts to kind of harmonize things but for the most part acceptance rates move a little but not a lot and I and I think that if the rule of law is there as our adjudication basis they shouldn't shift too much. Mm -hmm. What we have seen is this huge change in the number of people who are able to make a claim. And that begs the question, are we excluding people or are we, or are we not? But I, I think that, for example, um, Sri Lankan claims, um, the majority of them are accepted. 57% of people from Sri Lanka who make a refugee claim are accepted. Is so that higher than, than average? It is higher than average. I think the average for 2012, anyway, was uh, just under 44%. So, and, and if you go back to the 90s, uh, Sri Lanka was one of, the, one of the highest percentage in terms of uh, acceptance rates. It's, it's been very high historically, but now with the end of the military conflict, I'm not sure what wording we might want to use, but 2009 was a, was a, a bit of a turning point. But, uh, but we know that there's still reasons for people to leave the country. Um, well, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, there seems to be this, this strange sort of, th there are two moves that the government made in well, you can say 2013, that don't seem to be in harmony with each other. First of all, you have, with regards to Tamils, I would say, and with regards to Tamils in Sri Lanka, first you have Bill C-31, and then you have the Commonwealth Summit and the fact that Stephen Harper didn't, I don't know if one of you would like to talk, that he didn't go to the, the, um, the summit. So I don't know if you'd like to comment on that, Jennifer. Well, I agree with you. It's, it's a conundrum. I call it the votes, not boats conundrum. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, it's laudable that uh, Prime Minister Harper didn't go to, to the Commonwealth Summit as a statement about the pretty dreadful uh, situation of human rights in Sri Lanka, the, the ability of the government to actually, you know, launch an independent inquiry. We're talking five years, almost five years after. Uh, the you know the um, atrocities there, and I and I think that you know y y you you either stand for human rights and you uphold them, or you don't. But you can't you can't prevent people who arrive in a boat making a refugee claim from a country that has some problems with human rights. 
that you happen to be boycotting a summit for. I right, yeah. you, you can't have it both ways. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful and confident. We've got a new minister, we've got, you know, new, a new year. Um, my hope is that, you know, there will be some reconciliation of this kind of conundrum, as I call it. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that. Sure, I mean, I think, I think we are at a, an interesting point in, in the election cycle and also in, in public opinion when it comes to asylum seekers. I mean, it's one thing to, to boycott a summit, but it's another to introduce such sweeping legislation without really consultation, um, you know, with people on the ground, lawyers, settlement workers, even doctors. I mean, there was unprecedented opposition to Bill C-31, and that wasn't really taken into account when it was being drafted. So, and there's also actually a, a legal challenge in place, um, because like you mentioned with the, with the cuts to the refugee health care, um, basically, uh, lawyers are trying to prove that, that this bill is uh, unconstitutional. So, I mean, Canada is still trying to kind of uphold its image of being a benevolent, welcoming country, but it's not always the case when you actually look at the legislation. Interesting. And that might be the point we have to end on. Thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure. It was a Thank wonderful you for discussion. Us. And I, it sounds like we're going to have you on again <laughs> because you're doing that. research in that area. Great. So here are our final thoughts for the day. There is very little documentation of migration and refugee stories in the Tamil diaspora. Well, recently, there was a flicker of light in that tunnel. A team, including a former guest on this show, Sindhijan Varadaraja, has created this compelling initiative. It's called Roots of the Diaspora that, in their words, aims to collect and curate stories of flight and migration of Tamils from the South Asian island of Sri Lanka with the aim of remembering and valuing the travelers, refugees, and migrants alike, their journeys, its borders, and geographies. Again, their words. And the stories are as lovely as that statement there. We hope to have them on the show this year, but did feel it was important to mention them in this discussion on asylum seekers. You can find those stories under Roots of the Diaspora on Facebook, and really, they are very compelling reads. Thank you all for joining us. You've been watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Salvraja. Have a great week. Tamil Indian Bomb, Uncle TV.